Lawton. Homeless would not have been the way I described myself in the early summer of 2004, but that is exactly what I was. To say it was my own fault would be an understatement, and part of me knew that even then. But I wouldn't have broken down and told anyone that for any sum of cash or helping hand at the time, no matter the temptation. Ragged but practical, my old leather coat and cracked, battered hiking boots kept the constant rain of the June mornings just bearable enough for me to keep my pride. Pressing east along the roads, I shadowed. I forced one tired foot after the other out before me in a chain of ever-weakening steps that made every thought of my final destination seem a shallow sham, slapped low by the pain of blistered, wet ankles and heels which cried out under even my dwindling weight. One hundred and ten miles I'd walked, moving through fifteen a day and holding fast to a limit of sixteen to spare my feet undue cruelty on the long path. Even with years of experience wandering the hills and hiking long spans in the low mountains and knobs of my home back west down the maze of uncaring roads and highways, the trip and my lack of real meals and provisions dragged me farther and farther towards surrender, especially as eastern Kentucky's rolling hills turned to mountains and the first echoes of the Appalachians yawned up to meet me. Telling myself I needed only go forty miles further to reach my destination in Huntington had been shoved aside early that morning, when the sun was still low enough on the horizon to peek through the storm clouds up above. Now that seemed an insurmountable obstacle, and having put most real thoughts of hope or relief aside, stubbornness and anger alone dragged me down the old country roads and across rickety bridges toward my destination my sole place of refuge. Nine days prior, I had informed my parents of my intention to drop out of classes at the University of Louisville and had returned home to Clarksville, about an hour south of Lexington. I'd begun in 2002 with every intention of pursuing a history degree and either continuing on up the chain of postgraduate study or becoming a teacher, but my interest in any chosen field wasn't enough to shield me from all the problems that had been stalking me since before my arrival at college. Drinking had already been a vice before I left, but when I gained more ready access to alcohol and a place away from parents and direct observation to sleep off a nasty hangover or two, things got out of hand. Still, I managed to do passably during my freshman year. That wasn't to last. The untimely death of Warren Carter, a high school friend and great confidant of mine who shared many a midnight musing with me on our constant evening calls across the state, dragged me wholly into the pit. Loss might have been bearable if I had kept wider circles of friends, but outside of academic acquaintances, I was quite alone as a transplant in a new town. Magnifying the blow all the more was the fact that suicide was what had taken him from us, and I had been as blind as anyone in his family to any signs he might have been struggling so greatly. Guilty, alone, and attempting to avoid reflection, I burned a great deal of the money my parents had sent along for food and expenses on liquor, bought through a roommate, and my temper began to drive off any friends I might have made in Louisville. When sophomore year ended, I was a wreck, and I stumbled home with all the apathetic arrogance I could muster. School didn't matter anymore, and neither did the future. Looking forward had handed me nothing but disappointment, so I was more than prepared to stop looking altogether. Parents often prove harder and more willful than their children assume they will, though, and upon hearing that I didn't aim to return to school and had no intention of finding a job back in Clarksville, fights broke out. Drinking was the biggest issue, and it didn't help that I had arrived drinking, the whole swerving ride home having been a stewing pot for this rancid moment. My father and I shouted back and forth until the night of the 8th had passed and the morning of the ninth had played out to sunrise, and with light beating down on the fields and wooded hills outside, 
I rounded up my belongings and stormed out, having my cheap cell phone and parent-furnished car keys snatched as I went. Slipping on my hiking pack, filling it with hastily gathered clothes and grabbing up all the camping gear I'd built up over years of traveling with my father and grandfather, I tucked some three hundred stashed dollars left over from my drained school account into my old boots and turned my back on home. I cringe now to think of myself back then, but in the moment I thought myself a regular Davy Crockett, prepared to stride out and find a way to make it in the world on my own, giving the finger to the established law that was my parents. Warren was dead. My grandparents were half a continent away, and most other childhood friends I could call were off in colleges as widespread as California and Florida. My last hope was a close cousin of mine, Wilbur, whose small trailer home outside Huntington, West Virginia, lay only a couple weeks hard hiking away from me. He would give me a spot to sleep for a while at the very least, and though I had no interest in plotting out my goals farther than finding refuge in Huntington, I needed something to take my mind off my problems something to make me feel proactive. Stranded for the first time on a horrifying yet exciting isle of independence, I needed to make myself move. Hiking to town along Highway 150 that morning and spending about a fifth of my money on the cheapest canned and dried food I could gather, I then wound east along the roads, planning to find more along the way. I stopped where I could, often hiding just off the highway in thick copses of trees or particularly tall and verdant patches of grass to cover up with my tarp and unfurl my sleeping bag, my tent getting abandoned on the first night in favor of lighter travel. Evenings and nights in the open were long, and though I yearned for drink in a way that still rattles my thoughts years later, my age and a lack of willing buyers kept me away from gas station beer runs or cheap liquor sold in roadside hovels. When passing close to eastern Lexington on the third night of my trip, I raided the dumpster of a used bookstore and picked up an old Harold Lamb history on Hannibal of Carthage, and would read it during the still, cricket-scored nights when small-town streetlights or the light of a full moon allowed me to pick out the words without wasting the batteries I had in the sole flashlight I carried. Before long, I actually found myself enjoying the trek, staying dry when I could and buying cheap food at rest stops and fast food joints along the rural routes after filling my water bottles in their bathroom sinks, each day another adventure to keep my mind from wandering back home or further afield to Louisville and months of aimless rambling and drinking. Days dragged, though, and by the time the 16th came, I was ragged as could be, only to find myself even more spread thin by the 18th, when morning found me forty miles from Huntington. Worse than all of this was that my copy of One Man Against Rome was muddied and falling apart in the recent rains, even within my pack. Despite having already finished it, rereading its pages put me at some ease while I waited for the dawn or looked forward to sleep, and having to abandon it left me sour indeed. Having moved six miles by noon at a snail's pace, and facing steeper and steeper hills as the eastern ridges loomed higher, I found myself relieved to see the community of Lawton picked out on a green sign nearly swallowed by trees off to the side of the roadway, its surface pocked and marred by several holes left by buckshot. I had never heard of the town, nor did I expect it to be bustling after days of passing sparse housing in the deep forested knobs and only sporadic traffic along the treacherous roads, but I needed to rest, and here I might find a gas station to grab a cold bottle of water, and a sheltered tree line or barn in which to hide from the insistent bite of rain. As I rounded a long curve in the road between two small trailers set back in the trees away from view, I saw that even those modest hopes were a bit much. Lawton's main street, an unmarked and pothole-ridden section of Route 174, was flanked by just four buildings, most of which would be better described as ruins. One, perhaps an old service station, 
had burnt down and been left to wither in blackened piles in view of two larger, two-story buildings. Skeletal things I saw labeled as a mining company's laborer store and a schoolhouse, whose construction had long ago sunk into wholesale decadence. A larger home had sat just to the right of the old service station, just twenty yards from the road, but the leaning pile had long ago tumbled in on itself, and sat decaying in the rain alongside its withered companions. Lawton was really and truly a ghost town, for most of the trailers and tiny homes along the rural roads all fed into the town of Olive Hill, some ten miles off, and no one had mourned the loss of the brutal old concrete and slab structures of older, poorer days. Feeling a little bit deflated, I wandered on still raw feet over to the front stairs of the school, and sat just to the front of its boarded and stinking entryway, lowering myself carefully with the aid of the rusted railings and only stressing my feet when absolutely necessary. Pulling the now split and discolored leather gloves I kept over my hands off and reaching into my pack, I pulled out the last of my small bags of gas station bought store brand beef jerky, sucking it down as if it were the finest cut of sautéed tender veal I'd tasted to date before going for my water bottle and draining what creek water I had left within it. I knew full well I might pay during my bowel movements that night for drinking this stuff without having boiled or treated it, but there had been no stores at which to replenish my water, and no spots to raise a fire without drawing attention from the road through the dark trees. There was no telling what was and wasn't private property out here, and I was many miles within the borders of exactly the kind of land my grandfather had often referred to as 12-gauge country. Even if you did get relatively lucky and find a patch of land that belonged to the Daniel Boone National Forest, you'd then have fire watchers and rangers to worry about. This was not the time to trespass without knowing full well just who you were dealing with, and I didn't know anyone out there in the metropolis that was downtown Lawton. Water spent, I bent my head and thought, Thankful for the sanity-saving shelter of the old school's entrance, but knowing I didn't dare risk staying long in the tottering building, given the collapse risk the place must pose. The town's structures were off the list of potential housing for the night, and though I hadn't seen a car in half an hour and the towering forested hills locking the valley in promised all the visual shelter I would need to fight the rain beneath a thick stand of trees and camp beneath my tarp, I was desperate for a night in relative luxury. I wanted a barn or shed, something to keep my thoughts from even drifting passively towards my aching, moisture-racked feet in their wrappings of damp socks. I needed to move just a bit more, to find somewhere safe to hole up for the night and fix up my spirits, especially with no gas station around to promise easy food and drink. The trip, and what little pride I had left after this long on the road, depended on it. Looking up and across the street, my eyes found the only branch away from the road here in Lawton's old center, a path I had initially taken for another gravel driveway or decayed parking space. Choked on either side by a wrecked service station and a house, it snaked behind these and up into the hills beyond the only indicator that it was anything other than a driveway being an old, beaten white marker which proclaimed the path to be Mushroom Road in dark, barely legible paint which had long ago gone to seed. I chuckled to myself and, looking down the road both to the east and west and seeing nothing that looked to be anything other than driveways, mustered up a new strength and rose striding over the rain-beaten pavement and onto the crunching surface of the oddly named road beyond. The going was hard, especially given the condition of my feet and the exhaustion that had shrouded me since moving into the Appalachian foothills, but I managed. There was a rickety but seemingly passable old metal bridge over a creek, which promised to be a potential water source for me. But beyond filling my water bottle and a spare canteen in the backpack, I didn't bother to strike camp just yet. A stone sign across the bridge, not a hundred and fifty yards from where I'd left 174 and gone onto the gravel, proclaimed in weathered lettering that the land was the property of the Lynch Limestone Company, 
a name which had decorated the entryway of the store in town, and where there were defunct companies, there were likely to be defunct buildings. I only hoped I could find more sturdy lodgings than the store and the school farther uphill. Mushroom Road sloped upward so steeply after the creek had been passed and the forest had surrounded me in full that I doubted most average cars could easily get up the slick gravel path. Perhaps a sturdy truck or jeep, but even then they would be hard-pressed by some of the tight switchback curves and turns in the trail. Trudging up, though, I realized that a cinder-block wall stood perhaps a five-minute walk away up the trail through the trees, and I moved all the faster seeing that it was relatively straight and unbent by the time which had so crippled Lawton. The noises of the striking rain and the wind in the leaves above couldn't deter me now, not when salvation was so close. I almost smiled to myself when I crested the last rise in the trail and brought myself up to equal ground with the hulking cinderblock structure, and audibly laughed to myself when I saw that it had a tin roof which, while rusted, was on a square building with sturdy sides. I had found my fortress, a place to rest and catch my breath after far too long on the road. Slightly raised from the grass and scrub-choked ground on a concrete foundation, a ramp led up to a thin doorway through which was the one-room interior, a wide, open storage space perhaps as big as a football field. A few stacks of aged wooden pallets dotted the floor, but for the most part it was an empty and dry space, only a few leaks here and there breaking through the roof to puddle upon the ground. Crossing the place with my flashlight out, I saw that the opposite end of the building featured a raised stone platform with a cheap, warped desk and several chairs sitting atop it, all backed by a large square opening, which might have been a loading bay at one time, but which now lacked a door to block it from the woods beyond. Light breached the building fairly well over here, and as I worked my way up onto the dusty platform, I shut off the flashlight, knowing I might need the battery as the night drew in. Checking the desk's top for old papers and stock documents, and finding none before looking to the chairs, I brushed one off and rested my pack on it, leaving it as I moved up to the loading bay and looked out. The rain-soaked woods seemed thick all around the sides of the building in which I stood. But back here a clearing opened up, with only sparse patches of tall grass and scrub to break the shattered pavement of an old parking lot or work area. Most immediate in my eyes, though, was the slope of bare, cracked limestone seventy or eighty yards off, a sheer rise which may well have been quarried back to give the Lynch Company space to build on the steep hillside. Into that vertical surface, their mouths gaping and grinning back at me through the mist and rain of morning as it filtered into noon, had been carved the shadowed and rough-cut entrances of a mine. Tapping my foot against the cool, shaded stone of my newly claimed home and downing my freshly filled canteen, I watched water pour from a slow stream's terminal at the top of the man-made cliff's peak and add to a deep pond which filled the wide maw of one of the passages, the pattering noise of the waterfall barely audible through the general din of the rain. Behind those mouths rose pockmarks on the already assaulted stone, profanity and initials marked out in graffiti decorating the walls of the mines just beyond the entrances, even in this lonely place. The exterior of this rear portion of my building bore those marks too, and looking down the four or so feet to where the raised platform from which the loading dock opened came into a halt, I saw the hushed glimmer of many broken glass bottles, the trophies of several drinkers' evenings apparently spent in the very spot I'd chosen to stake my claim. Growing more impressed by the sight every moment, I took up my flashlight again and lowered myself from the little ledges into the weeds, rocks, and glass meaning to get a feel for the area before I settled in too much and caught up on much-needed rest. Weary feet almost forgotten, I crunched across the rough patch just beyond the storage building and traversed the little clearing beyond, noting that there were a few old pieces of furniture and erect bed frames scattered about. 
The derelict mine was likely little more than a dumping ground now, but every step closer made me realize just how massive the whole complex must be. Five openings led into the mine, and even without my light on I could see in the glow of the gloomy day outside that the space inside was a grid, with rough walls and ceilings flanking crisscrossing tunnels which were about twenty feet wide by twenty feet tall, wide enough to move moderately sized digging equipment and whole groups of men through at a time. It looked like a subterranean quarry, with all the chutes cut horizontally to make a single-floor complex, and when I disrupted the blackened, dusty innards of the place with my flashlight's powerful beam, I could see no farther than twenty rows or so of intersecting tunnels before the mist and dust of the complex snuffed out my sight. Kneeling and gripping a heavy stone, I tossed it as far as I could along the rocky hall in front of me, listening to the echo of its clatter as it rolled and hearing no hint of a nearby end to the sprawling shadow. Enthralled as I was with the mine itself, I cursed that I hadn't kept more batteries in my pack, knowing I had only those in my flashlight in a single, lonely D-cell to back them up. It would not do to waste the things poking around on an exploration of the mine. Jointly, even as I berated myself for not having the equipment to enter, the whining wail of the wind shifting through those long, vacant stone pillars drifted past me in the cool air of the passage's mouth, and I shuddered. Fascinating it certainly was, but it was eerie as hell, too and it wouldn't do to dwell on that when it would lurk so close after nightfall, and the clearing between me and the limestone mines was cloaked in masking shadow, a thought which brought my mind to fire. Wide and tall as the entryway to the back of the storehouse was, it would make an excellent site for a fire, letting most of the smoke escape through the wall along with most of the heat which suited me just fine given how hot most of the nights were if you could extract yourself from the rain. That, combined with the height of the entrance, would keep most wandering animals away. But the open front entrance might be a concern. I was getting farther into the mountains and farther away from active roads, and while it was not terribly likely that black bears were thick in the area, it was a distinct possibility. They aren't generally violent, but they are definitely curious, and I would much rather do a half-hour's work now to make sure they stayed away during the night than wake up in the wee hours to find one rifling my pack, six or seven feet from my head. All that to say, I needed firewood and a makeshift door before I settled in, and while I could burn the wet wood out in the forest, it would not make for good fire-starting material. Pallets like those in the storage building flanked one of the clear tunnels not far in, though and most were not in good shape. The stray boards and splinters, bone dry after decades underground, would make perfect tinder. Keeping my light high, I pressed a few feet into the mouth of the tunnel nearest the pallets and made for the piles. Breathing in felt like sniffing sand once you were well and truly inside, and I found my eyes stung by the hanging dust of the place. Traveling the twenty or thirty feet to the wood, I slipped my gloves back on and began collecting an armful, my ears once again being assailed by the whine of the wind and the passages all around me, its wail mixing hauntingly with the pattering sound of water from outside. Wood creaked in protest as I pulled it from the pallets or clattered as I groped for it in the shadows, mindful of spiders in the piles. Every sound was a cacophony in the stifling air, seeming to break the looming atmosphere and make evident the presence of a lone intruder, this meek wanderer looking for comfort, on the precipice of the beyond nocturnal world which sprawled out just beyond the grasp of my electric light. Like Roman legionnaires at Cannae, I felt surrounded, suddenly drowned in more nervousness than I'd felt in all my days and nights on the road, despite my close proximity to the exit. I rose, now holding five fair-sized planks and a great many smaller pieces, and threw my flashlight's beam all around, almost expecting some lightning-fast assailants to fling themselves out of the shadow at me before I had time to so much as think about stepping towards the exit. 
Nothing awaited my searching light but the still decay of mounded wood and the looming dark stone of the place's walls, a discarded container of spray paint or a crushed beer can here and there being the only interruption to time's marching order of moldering disintegration. I shook my head, standing for a moment in self-shaming silence before making for the light outside. Two rats that had been foraging quietly somewhere in the dark darted through the tunnel's maw, just as I did, and I was momentarily grateful to be alone, so that my exaggerated flinch at their flurry of movement went unnoticed by all save the rodents and myself. Exhaling and vigorously shaking my head in a short burst as if a show of force might remove whatever fear lingered in me, I stalked back across to the back of the storage building and mounded the wood just to the side of the loading doorway, keeping my gaze forward and my back to the mine. I would not let the shadows of an old quarrying operation scare me away from the best hideaway this whole trip had coughed up for me. Only when I had finished did I allow myself a glance over the shoulder, and I found nothing amiss save my own shaky demeanor. Snorting audibly at myself, despite the startled shakes still playing themselves out at my fingertips, I brought my mind back to the task at hand and hoisted myself up into the building again. I grabbed a light crowbar and hatchet that rested in the main pocket of my pack and went back out into the rain, pulling back my hood and letting the drops cool me a bit after I realized the fall was growing less steady. Making for a pile of several dressers and a table out in the clearing, I set about breaking up this partially soaked and rotten trash, unwilling to go back towards the mouth of the mine despite my self-deprecation. Never would I have given voice to it at the time should someone else have come wandering along the gravel road just then to ask me about it, but something about the mine didn't feel right. Interesting, yes, but too oppressive too filled with wailing wind and dripping water to stand for long. Burying it in work, I was soon too absorbed in the destruction of old furniture to let my imagination run wild, the fear turning to a dull thud rather than a pounding roar and receding into the depths. I knew it might return, though, and so took some joy in spotting another project to busy myself with on one of my trips back to the storage buildings to deliver wood. Off on the hill, sloping down away from the mine site, was resting a horrendously damaged and grimy mattress, likely that of the bed frame which rested not far from the garbage pile I now attacked for fuel. Once the pile in the big storage shed was sizable enough for me to feel confident relying on it and the few pallets already stacked in the lower portion of the building, I got to work dragging the mattress uphill and around the building towards the front, tramping down a path through the brush along its sides when necessary and moving the thing in short bursts to give my tired legs time to rest. Once I got it out front to the face of the cinder block behemoth, I slid it up the concrete ramp built into the foundation and through the open entryway, lodging it firmly into the small doorway. Back around to the rear of the building I went, and, climbing in once more, I then dragged a pallet over to the door's interior and added its weight to the barricade, leaning it up against the barrier and sliding a few errant cinder blocks up to the base to seal the deal. It was no castle gatehouse, but it would hopefully deter any wandering bears drawn to the smells of camp, along with any expeditions of local teenagers looking to brave the mine. Water was the last thing to see to, and then some much-needed rest could be gotten. I was out after depleting the water bottle howling wood, and with several sources nearby I would be a fool to let the opportunity for refills go to waste. Striding back across the shadowy innards of the storage building, I climbed the cracking old staircase to the loading platform and got my canteen and water bottle out of the pack, along with a little tin mug I used for boiling water, and then turned for the open air again. My eyes found the mine's mouths, and I halted, unsure of myself. Considering my options, I actually began debating whether I really wanted to return to the maw of that subterranean maze, 
or whether I wanted to hike for ten minutes back down the mountainside to fetch water in the stream below. Every rational thought in my head told me to walk back across the clearing and make for the pooling water beneath the clear, clean stream coming down from above the cliff, but some animal part of my brain grated up against all that, its sandpaper warnings desperate for a retreat from this damp, gloomy hillside, however momentary. For a minute and more I stood and debated, but when the time came and I slid down from the loading platform to crush once more the shattered glass pooled below my chosen camp, it was around the building and towards the road I went, not back towards the mine. The path down was rather easy. It was the trip back up the steep incline that I dreaded. I filled my bottle, canteen, and mug near a babbling, soft set of rapids, the rushing water being a safer bet than the more stagnant and slow stints of creek. Then I turned back, humming aimless and disjointed tunes to no one and attempting to convince myself that this inane trip had been undertaken due to a desire to wander a bit, rather than due to unfounded fear. Every step brought me closer to a comfortable rest, but also closer to the mine. Every step brought me closer to my newly claimed and mildly fortified home for the night, but also closer to the mine. I found myself dreading the crest of the last rise as my calves ached and my feet cried out for relief, dreading the rounding of the stone building through the tall grass and trees, dreading the first glimpse of the mine. But again, despite all that inner worry and tremor, the dark mouths across the way held nothing but rock and graffiti for me when I came back into their company, just as they had when I'd left them. I don't usually make it my business to talk aloud to myself, but there was some muttered cursing and chastising as I crawled back up through the loading door, careful to place my filled mug in a safe spot before ascending. Wasting no time, I pulled a plastic bag filled with a mixture of old and dried orange peel and torn scrap paper plucked from dumpsters and piled it out before the opening, perhaps two feet back from the ledge. Around this, I built the shielding dome of the dried wood from the mine, along with the more sheltered portions of the drawers I had disassembled outside, and soon I had my knife in hand, striking it on the flint stick that tucked into its sheath and blowing lightly yet eagerly on any sparks I managed to bring out. Some time passed, but eventually a spark took, and fortunately, I didn't need to search for further material. Some of the larger chunks of wood from the tunnels caught, and with their heat, I was able to catch some of the furniture, which in turn would aid with the rest. My fire was finally set, and, pushing my mug with cautious gloved hands up to the brightest of the glowing planks, I sat on the concrete in silence and tended my little flame. Thirty minutes and more passed before the fire brought the mug's contents to a steady bubble, but I didn't mind the wait. For the first time in a few days, I had a real camp, and now that I knew I wouldn't be fooling around with the knife striking flint all evening trying to get a blaze off the ground and going, there was nothing to do but try and relax. I had removed my shoes when the fire first took, and I now removed my socks, laying both the more recent soggy pair and the other damp pairs from my pack out on a nearby cinder block and drying them near the heat being as conservative with my gathered wood as I could to keep from exhausting the pile. Blisters were cleaned as best I could manage with boiled water and a relatively unsoiled rag, and then I moved to one of the old metal chairs, propping my feet up in the other and shifting it closer to the flame. Relaxing doesn't even begin to describe that feeling, not after all the stumbling and limping along I had done over the past few days. Despite all of that, though, some nagging part of my mind remained with the holes in the cliffside across the clearing, and I kept my chair facing them over the fire, so that when nerves grew too strained, a light glance would soften my worry again. I tried not to think of how I would cope with rising nerves when the nearly moonless, cloudy night came and the tunnels became all but invisible. 
Checking the cheap and blocky weatherproofed watch I kept in the pack, I saw it was just past four, a surprise given how drowsy I was beginning to feel. Like a toddler fighting sleep, I leaned into a doze again and again only to jerk myself awake at the last moment, returning to my vigil over the fire. Deciding I'd better get what food I had together and fix myself some dinner, I dragged out the two packets of oatmeal I had saved, setting my last granola bar away from these and hoping it was not all I would eat tomorrow. The mug made a makeshift bowl, and I ate the watery mixture in silence, a spoon lost earlier on the trip forcing me to drink the stuff rather than eat it by the spoonful. Hardly had I cleaned the mug and set it back against the flame to boil a bit of the canteen's water when my head bobbed, and this time I didn't try to fight it. I'd come up here to rest, and I meant to rest. Mine be damned. Sleeping in the metal, armless chairs wasn't the grand spot, but it wasn't the most uncomfortable thing I had done on my trip. My sleeping bag could be left aside with the heat of the fire to keep me warm and dry, and so my mind was left to wander as I shifted uncomfortably on my perch and found what dreams I could. Though I remember none of them, I'm certain that's a good thing. When again I opened my eyes, feeling almost more tired than I had when going to sleep and nearly questioning whether I had truly done so, I was fast told by the watch that what had felt like a blinking nod had been four hours, and eight o'clock had already come and gone. Stoking the low fire and blowing its embers back into service, I had it going along at a steady rate before long and, taking the time to listen, heard that the rain striking the tin roof had slowed to an absent-minded trickle. Knowing that the shadows all around me were long indeed, I fought the urge to look out towards the mines. Rubbing the sleep from my eyes, reminding myself that there hadn't ever been anything to see, and mechanically setting about checking my drying socks to see how the process was coming along, I promised myself I wouldn't indulge in another look. After all, Doing so would only get my mind whirring again just before sunset, and make the night all the more dragging while I imagined all sorts of encounters that would keep me twitching and jumping through the whole blind, infuriatingly creepy cycle. Unfortunately, my conviction didn't last through more than five minutes of frequent watch references and scans of the wood supply. Standing and pretending for an audience of no one that I had done so to stretch my tired legs and back rather than scan the other side of the clearing, I swept my eyes across the rock of the cliff face, its light limestone surface speckled with what aging rays from the oncoming sunset could reach the place through the dissipating cloud cover and the woods blanketing the mountains. Shadowy entrances, broken stone, sloppy graffiti, bent scrub and dry grass. For the moment, the rain had halted its offensive, and despite the coming of the night, the mines were there clear as they had ever been, not a stone out of place. The leftmost still wound off at an odd angle. The central few displayed their banners of broken glass and spray paint. My eyes stopped cold then, my mind struggling for a moment as it attempted to catch up. My self-insulting snort caught like a bloodied, scared animal in a vice before it could be delivered. Mountainside, fire, storehouse, and all might as well have melted away, leaving just me in that lone, dusk-cloaked cavern in the sodden wilderness. There, in that last tunnel, the rightmost opening, whose mouth puddled into a pond, and whose rocky corridor was filled mostly with a shallow stream running backwards into the darkness, perhaps ten or fifteen feet back from that aperture in the unforgiving cliff. A shape loomed. From behind a tall yet leaning pile of pallets partially submerged in the incoming water poked a pale form I was certain hadn't been there at all prior to this very moment given the number of furtive glances I had thrown in the direction of that cursed crag. White next to the near blackness of the old wood, it was, and though distance in the coming night kept me uncertain, 
I could swear in the decaying light of that dying and stormy day as I stared at a pallid shape I couldn't place. Two wide, staring pools of soft, reflected light gleamed back from the darkness. To say that my heart froze and my body locked as if frozen down to the tips of my fingers would be cliché, but to say otherwise would be to lie, and no good will come of relating this story if I can't manage to be as transparent as possible in the retelling. All my self-assurance, all my tentative intellectual posturing, all the hours safely spent in the dark along my long road east, all these went straight to hell as I stared into that man-made cave mouth and tried to judge whether I was seeing what I thought I saw. Like a shocked child searching some infernally challenging picture puzzle, I narrowed my eyes and tried to breathe deeply, measuring every inhale and exhale, my mouth just slack enough that I could feel the rusty, earthen rottenness of that pit on the breeze. The rain was gone, but the wind remained, and the howl of its passage through the column-lined cavernous maze was maddening in the unnaturally quiet woods which loomed sinister all around almost driving me to cringe as might the squeal of metal ground against metal. Through it all, those shallow, broad spaces of yellowish reflection stared, not a single tremor or blink giving pause to their vigil. Minutes must have passed, each one an eternity there upon the storage building's exposed loading platform. I must be a ragged and dark yet vividly clear outline to any who looked on from the cliff, my every moment cast in the orange tint of the fire, and magnified by the huge open shadow behind me, a fact I was beginning to become painfully aware of. Having seen no movement at all for so long, having stood staring so very intently, I forced myself to wonder, veered back into the realm of sanity, lest I turn tail, hop from the platform, and run panting and scrambling across the storehouse, into the dusk like a madman. There were plenty of rocks prone to holding mineral deposits, large or small, scattered across Kentucky. Had I missed some broken stone long fallen from the mine ceiling earlier in the day? Some geode split open and laid out atop a pallet in the mine whose sparkling viscera even now glittered in the near-dead daylight? Then, as fast as they had seized me, the distant reflections let me slip quietly from their grip the last of the worst fear shuddering itself out of my extremities as I first scanned the whole of that open, flooded tunnel for the slightest sign of movement, and then turned my attention to the pallets, hard-pressed to decide whether this was a good or bad development. Though I know not how it had happened, for it must have been striking and quick enough for a blink or twitch in my observation to cloak any movement, the shape had gone both the pale object and its wide, reflective pools having vanished. Left behind was only the mine's watery patter, as the small waterfall from the stream mouth above fed its gnawing underground channel, the shadow of the rubble and ill-kept entryway's ruin, and the feeling of uneasy sickness left in my stomach by the confusing thing I had just witnessed. Watching was not a strong enough word for the vigil I kept on the place as the minutes slipped past me there in the deepening shadow. Questioning my own sanity, I scanned all the entryways in turn, paying special mind to the flooded channel. None were out of the ordinary, and not a single stone or cracked wall caught my attention. All were empty, vessels without occupants as they had likely been for decades prior to my feet finding the winding road which led here. There arose in me a desire to retreat down the mountain before dark wholly settled in, to reach the ghost town down below and try my luck the better part of a mile off in one of the shattered school's rooms, but I quickly shot the notion down. I had ten or fifteen minutes before true night, and the woods would be anything but comforting at this hour. I would be just as uneasy and jittery on a walk down to the town, and I knew that. The only thing that could justify such a move was if there was indeed something in the mines that ought to be avoided, and I was definitely not ready to concede that. 
Every moment spent distancing myself from the gripping sight of those eyes was another in which I shored up what courage I had, and reminded myself that I was out on my own, striking off on the road east, not willing to bend a knee and put out a call for help. Even talks with my cousin had been avoided on the walk up save a call from a gas station in East Lexington to ensure my coming wouldn't be a burden. I had been sucked into this morass, and now I alone would be responsible for pulling myself out. Gritting my teeth and narrowing my eyes in an effort to force myself into at least mild surety, I donned my dried socks and boots before taking up my flashlight in my left hand and sliding down from the loading platform, beginning my way across the ever darker span between myself and the mine keeping my crowbar handy at my right side in case my mind and the scenery hadn't been playing tricks on me in the dark. There would be nothing there when I arrived, I knew. Repeating that mantra to myself, I made the internal promise that only if some shadow of Satan himself spit angrily out of the mind mouth would I allow myself to act the child here and run through the dark down the mountain. Otherwise, it was right back to the storehouse, my fire and my sleeping bag. Forty miles to go might have been a small leg compared to the distance I'd already covered, but forty miles was still forty miles, and even if I didn't get a wink of sleep out here tonight, I was determined to keep my feet dry and rested for once after long days in the damp. Approaching the flooded aperture, I scanned the shadowy scenery that waited just within, Pallets and a few piles of stones, the first things to strike me. The remainder of the passage beyond sprawled into shadow not far from where I stood, leaving me to marvel again at the misty dark of that long, choked night in the tunnels. My grip tightened on the crowbar unconsciously, my mind only registering the act when my nails began to bite deep into my palm. In the clear, trickling water pooled in that torn portal, Despite the disturbance caused by the light waterfall, I could see that the stone floor lay a solid two or more feet down below the surface out past the shore, and that the stack of pallets, whose height I might have placed around seven feet on its own, was actually taller. The nine or more feet of its tottering, aged bulk were crowned now with only the dust and grime that years in this yawning damp had left, but its proximity gave me more cause to shiver. Almost scared of the consequences, I flicked on the flashlight and bounced it around the tunnel, but was met by nothing but a deeper grasp of the dusty black. No reflection save that of the water glared back at me, and no noise save that of the waterfall and that awful, screeching wind in the columns could be heard. With one last look up to the peak of that sodden wooden pile, I made myself turn for my shelter in the flickering light of the fire again, telling myself off for my foolishness. This time there was no solid restraint, though, and the walk was punctuated with many glances over my shoulder and scans of the surrounding mine mouths. When I had at last put the fire back between me and the clearing beyond and seen to it that the creaking warehouse in which I stood was empty of reflective eyes and lurking figures, The sun had well and truly gone, leaving me alone in a night whose darkness was bested only by the ebon openings across the clearing. My chair still positioned facing those holes in the rock, I set my now empty mug back to boil, leaned back, and settled in for what I knew even then would be a sleepless, mentally draining night. Thinking back on those hours now, at a distance, they seem long and arduous. Those words don't even begin to describe how they felt when I was trudging through them, though. My trip off the platform to have a piss in the broader low segment of the building was a calculated, considered risk. Treks to the woodpile next to the looming doorway were short but treacherous narratives sprinkled with furtive glances, and second takes at branches swaying in the breeze. Voyages over to my pack to refill the boiling mug with water were dangerous affairs followed up by long, cautious scans of the clearing outside, which occasionally featured the flashlight, momentarily taken up despite my paranoid battery conservation to ward off the encroaching mystery of the sheltered ground beyond. Crowbar close at hand beside the chair, I waited, 
eyes on the flooded breach out beyond the fire's light, which stood only as a black haze through the heat and smoke, boots firmly on despite how good I knew it might feel to kick up my feet bare by the fire again. Then, each time I felt an eternity must have slipped by in the company of the mine's wailing song on the wind. A long, delayed glance at my watch would let me know that twenty or thirty minutes had passed since the last glance, and my soul would melt just a little at the knowledge that hour upon hour still lay between me and the dawn. By midnight, my watch on the fire became more pronounced, though, and by two I stopped carrying my crowbar with me to the woodpile. Not a flinch had stirred in the night beyond the flame, and with less than four hours left until dawn, the bulk of the night was over and done with. I was far from at ease, for my eyes still found the mine as often as the flames, but I allowed myself distraction, taking up a pin pulled from a gas station trash can along with a bright piece of cardboard only partially marred by a beer logo found in the lower part of the building, to doodle like a small child. I distinctly remember sketching the crude outline of legionnaires on foot, struggling against elephants and cavalry, but I've forgotten what became of that hobo's canvas. The act spared my mind a bit of the tedium and torture of the wait, and with much greater ease than before, I found myself looking down at a watch that read four. So close was the morning that I could almost taste it on the sky peeking through the clouds less than two hours holding its relief back from me. These were things which I desperately needed to know, for despite the nap I'd gotten before nightfall, the trip and the heat of the fire were conspiring to make me painfully drowsy in the face of the wail of the wind in the old stone not far away. Several times during that span I nodded off in the chair for a moment only to reawaken in a jolt as the image of two pale reflective pools of light leered at me from memory and forced me alert, bringing me to my feet so I could send sleep running and scan the now familiar rock face beyond the clearing. Thus was passed another hour, nervous and shaky. Fruitless observations of the gloomy area around my fortress doing little to reassure me. Not long after five had come and gone, though, I drifted off once more after a final flashlight-aided scan of the outdoors. There is no way to know how long I was out. But given that the sun was not yet rising when I awoke, the sleep could not have been long. This time... It was not a memory or the roots of some nightmare which jolted me, nor was it the creaking of the roof which had so often caused me to glance at the opposite door and its mattress barricade. There came to my ears, through the now accustomed noise of the wind and the drip of water and the crackle of flame, a new and altogether more frightening sound, natural and instantly recognizable even in the haze of sleepy pre-dawn. The noise was enough to grip me so thoroughly that I held my eyes shut against the wakefulness into which I'd been tugged, now more than certain that the next observation of the cursed clearing would not be fine, knowing that the next whirling scan of my surroundings would not yield nothing. What I had felt before dusk at the sighting of those pools in the mine was nothing by comparison, for that had been potentially hallucinatory potentially dismissible. This was tangible, and it was easily understood, and most awful of all, it was unbearably close. Just beyond the flame, somewhere in the night beyond the shallow defense of the slight drop to the ground and my campfire, the glass in the rocky clearing outside shifted and crunched softly, its coming barely audible the settling crackle of its displacement speaking to weighty but cautious movement. In my frightfully light sleep, though, it was enough to stop my heart and freeze all motion down to my fingers and toes. Not even the strongest of winds had shifted that trash in the sparse gravel and grass of the open ground before the doorway. Only my boots had seen to that, and with me here next to the fire, that left only one possibility. Someone had stepped into the glass carpeting the ground before the doorway. 
though it took all my willpower not to shake or burst into unconsidered motion at the thought. It also meant that whoever this someone was should even now be just two or three yards off, so close to the fire they could touch the flame if they desired. Fire sweeping through an aged library or an avalanche barreling down a slope would compare well with the process going on behind my closed eyes. Even with only a few seconds separating the coming and the noise and the opening of my eyes, Plans of attack and retreat, which had likely been stewing under the surface of my thought all through the night, welled up and formed in the fore of my mind. Crowbar near at hand, a twitch of the arm would yank the thing up to my side while my chair was kicked back and I faced whatever snooping visitor had come so close to a clearly inhabited building. With the flashlight still in my lap and ready for use, this could serve as a secondary weapon if my guess at the crowbar's location proved incorrect and I found myself on my feet and unarmed. From there I could decide whether to retreat or confront whatever awaited me. Stealing myself as best I could and gritting my teeth against my nerves, I forced myself to act with jerking, hesitant force, each minute twitch of my eyelids as they opened an almost painful experience. Once they'd been peeled back far enough to give me a glimpse of the space beyond the fire, though, the plans flew away. There would be no grasp for the crowbar or stand before the light of the fire. I was fortunate in that moment of shocked terror that I had a mind to keep hold of my flashlight, for when I fled into the farther reaches of the warehouse, throwing myself from the raised platform without a care for the height, and skittering across the dirty floor with all the manner of a mouse caught pilfering a pantry, I otherwise took only what had been on me at the time of my awakening. The pack, the energy bar, my water, and all the rest of my gear were left forgotten on that platform in the storage building next to my dying fire. For all I know, they are still there on that shadowed mountainside these many years on gathering dust and grime with the passage of cruel years. Never in all my time spent studying and living in the region since have I ever dared return, even by car, to rotten and worm-eaten Lawton, much less the mine and its looming outbuilding. My memory of the place will forever be tainted by my hours there that night, and what I saw when sleep and worry had both been tossed free and I had allowed my eyes to find once more the space beyond the flame. Over that low pyre of discarded furniture and mine pallets, masked in the haze that had long hung low over the fire's now sputtering and sluggish flame, the familiar pools of light gleamed back at me. Even in my position atop the platform and slightly removed from their place outside the warehouse, they were a great deal farther from the ground than I, seeming massive at that negligible distance. Amber, empty disks set in a pallid, slippery frame, its shape vaguely human and its gaunt, bony structure conjuring up images of starving victims even through the blessedly vague veil of smoke. This company I found only for a moment before I tumbled back over the chair in which I sat and made like a fool for the far doorway, desperate to put distance between myself and those otherworldly things which I could no longer deny were eyes. Fortified mattress blown over and vaulted in a display of agility and strength I didn't consider possible in my beleaguered state, I made for the woods with all the haste I could muster my feet crying out under the strain as I crunched across the broken, decayed pavement. In those few seconds it took to reach the gravel path and begin my blind and panting descent in the dark, though, the worst glimpse was caught as my head reflexively took in a last scan of the now unbarred forward doorway, its dark frame backlit by the distant light of my fire on the other side of the warehouse. Poking from the doorway like an exaggerated scarecrow, Naked flesh bright even against the pale concrete and shoulders above the highest portion of the perhaps ten-foot split in the building's side. The gangly pursuer from the mine leered, its eyes now merely outlines in the dimness of the early morning, 
night once again blessing me with only a vague glimpse of its sunken, awful features. Sitting in safety now, I tell myself it cannot have been the case. But in that terrible second before the descent, heart thrumming like an engine in my ears and stomach churning at the fright I'd just received, I swear it looked as if more eyes peeked and glared from alongside the towering onlooker, stooped and crowded into the doorway to get a better view of the fleeting youth, who not a minute before had been within reach just beyond the fire. I descended the mountain in a flailing, aimless sprint after that, only stopping to catch my breath when the lights of the trailers and cabins near Lawton gleamed from either side of an actual paved road, and even the gutted school and its crumbling companions had been put far behind me. That morning I forsook my promise of self-reliance and began hitching rides the remainder of the way to Huntington bumming soda or extra water off those who had it in their cars until I reached my cousin. I didn't have it in me to wander in the mountains alone and unguarded for another couple days after that morning in Lawton, not even with the mine so far off behind me. There were countless mines and even more natural caves in these hills, I knew, and despite the hatefully rational explanations I dreamt up for what I had fled from in the dark, outside the limestone mines. On some level I knew I had not been hallucinating, dreaming, or fabricating noises. Whatever I had seen that summer night in the hills, I had no wish to ever see it again. I'm proud to say I turned things around after finding factory work in Huntington and building up a solid foundation of cash, but what sent me stumbling from my final campsite has left me permanently shaken. I don't know that I will ever again feel comfortable driving through the hills at night or trekking alone in the forests of eastern Kentucky. I went back to school, finished and pursued postgraduate study, finding an excuse to move west into the plains a year or two after graduation, where I received a doctorate in history. I've enjoyed my position at a museum in Kansas City, and while it isn't luxurious, it is comfortable and more than fulfilling. Relatives were told the move was for career purposes, and that explanation has long seemed to suffice, but lack of enthusiasm for return trips and family outings back home has been a bit more difficult to deal with. There is part of me who wishes their mutterings about burnt bridges and broken ties were justified. Part of me that wishes family troubles were all that kept me away. But I know better. Somewhere back east, still disturbing my sleep from states away, there lurk things in the ground that neither I nor anything I've read or researched can explain. Somewhere Beneath the rotten and decaying cores of tiny hamlets in the Kentucky hills dwells something which I can't understand, something a great deal more terrible than rough memories. Some ten hours away by car I stand safe and sound, however, and unless I'm dragged back kicking and screaming, that is exactly where I mean to stay. I put this pin to the proverbial paper now, only to give myself some small amount of closure through reflection and, perhaps more importantly, to warn off any in the region who find themselves intrigued by the caves and mines of Kentucky. Whatever your interest or inclination, I would advise steering clear. You just might be spotted by something equally intrigued by you.